thank you. Thank you uh, for your kind words. I hope you see my screen. Is that correct? You do you see that? Yeah, we can see your screen, sir. Oh, okay, right away. It's now good. I go. Uh, again, I want to thank you for your kind words and, of course, to appreciate the leadership of the chapter uh, for inviting me uh, to share my perspective on a very key aspect of enterprise development. That is, how do you transit a micro or small enterprise to a large business? Uh, that is what I, I will be addressing um, in the next few uh, minutes. I, I want to begin with some remarks. The first is the fact that we have always know that uh, we hear small is beautiful. There's no doubt about that. You small, beautiful. But I quickly want to add that uh, big creates greater value. Um, it makes greater impact. When you talk about business, obviously greater value for the stakeholders, especially the business owner or owners. Of course, large businesses tend to be more resilient, um, more resilient when dealing with turbulence that obviously will come across in the operating environment, uh, much more than small businesses. But the reality is that the business landscape uh, is dominated by small businesses. I, I think in most economies, uh, of course, especially in developing uh, nations. So my task obviously today is to see how I could, I can convince you to actually say, here I am, um, probably one unit business, one professional office, uh, whatever it is to grow and to desire and grow big. So my task appears to be, there are very few. The first is for us to address why a business should desire to grow. Um, again, I, I, I would not just simply grow in, able to scale up. Why should a business do that? Why should I do that? Of course, we are going to identify and discuss some required intervention for taking a business from a small level uh, to a bigger one. The obstacle, I think probably we're talking about one obstacle. When we get there, we, we get to know what is that obstacle for an enterprise uh, to scale up. Of course, I would take some questions if there are. I, I, I want to, I would don't really want to go into the debate on uh, how do you define a business, a small scale business, micro business, and a big business using the parameters of a Balashi size uh, volumes and of course, numbers of uh, employee. Rather, I want to simply look at the key features or characteristics of small businesses and also bigger businesses. I actually call them some mankas of small businesses. The first marker is the dominance of the business owner. I, I, this is understandable. In, in the first place, the business owner uh, provided the capital to um, start a business. Of course, when there is need for the capitalization, uh, he or she is the one that will provide. Uh, when it comes to the issue of managing, setting the direction for the business, um, in terms of governance, the business owner is dominant. But the challenge here is the fact that what the risk management practitioner will refer to as key man risk, uh, obviously become uh, um, evident in the sense that if there is any adverse uh, uh, issue that affects the owner of the business, the business itself will be at risk. Of course, the small businesses have to uh, deal with the whole issue of limited val volume of business. Uh, that will translate also small revenue and of course, uh, lesser uh, profit. Liquidity, is always an issue. Uh, and small enterprises, micro and small businesses tend to be always a, cha a challenge in terms of liquidity. The reason is also obvious. Small businesses have very restricted access to affordable uh, finances, uh, whether in terms of credit, in terms of 
uh, equity participation or whatever, there's always a challenge. Limited investment in technology is also uh, a, a marker of a small business, and that has implication for efficiency. Of course, uh, in most cases, for whatever reason, uh, staff or small businesses tend to be less motivated. Now, on the other hand, the markers for large businesses are here. The first is the fact that they are adequately resourced when it comes to uh, finance, finances. Uh, capitalization obviously get bigger. They're bigger. Uh, they have access to loans. In fact, big businesses are actually approach and even beg by lending institution to access credit. Of course, they have access to you know, capital market, uh, whether to raise fund or even to issue bonds. So they, 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 they have access to do that. Um, the volume of business obviously higher and that translates to you know, higher return uh, if you talk to about profitability. Uh, when it comes to uh, dealing with you know, uh, storms, of course, there will always be storm in the marketplace, uh, in the operating environment. Of course, we had the COVID-19 and recently we have the uh, CBN cash crunch. Those, those are some of the challenges. Of course, the key human risk is not there and staff are easily motivated. Now, um, we get to look at when we talk about scaling up, you know, when we talk about getting big, when we got about that. For me, uh, it, it is not just an incremental thing. It is not that you said you have a business where I want to get it big, a little, add one or two additional staff, uh, whatever it is. But that could be a part of it anyway. But what is important when it comes to scaling up a business is the fact that you go to do it on a significant scale. Uh, and in the process could also involve institutional transformation, trans transformation of key institutional structures and processes. And these include the organs and the processes of governance, management, especially financial management, risk management obviously would come in. And of course, the whole issue of people's management, if you like, we call it HRO, uh, human resource uh, management. So it is not just about, let me grow a little, but it is about um, you know, coming up with a sort of a plan and a process that would transform the enterprise. Transform the enterprise to be able to grow, to become big. Transform the enterprise for the structure to be able to manage, you know, to, to manage um, uh, uh, a large, enterprises. You need the right governance. You need the right management, especially financial. You need the right HRO uh, processes to be able to uh, sustain a large business. So having said that, uh, we, we go to the issue of why should I, in the first place, of course, why should I recommend? And for me, uh, as a business person, why did I decide to scale up. Uh, by way of small um, information here, um, immediately after the introduction of the structural adjustment program, we do know that, that the, there was a spike in the spread and the intensity of poverty. And that was the time I took 300 Naira in my church in Oguashuku, gave one 100, one 100 Naira uh, to three women in my church. Uh, that was the whole beginning. But over time, uh, today we've gone into millions of, uh, of borrowers. It is not just about the borrower. We have actually also transformed, set up a number of businesses. So it is about taking a decision, having the motivation to decide to scale up. Uh, so let's, I want to classify this motivation or factor or benefits into three dimensions. The dimension of the business itself, the dimension of the business owner itself, and the benefits in terms of the na national economic development or national development dimension. The first is the business itself. Let's begin with the business itself. Um, like I noted earlier, 
Uh, small businesses tend to be very, very, very vulnerable. Um, during the COVID-19, um, we do know that most of these small, micro, small businesses actually went under. On on and on the other hand, uh, businesses that have the capacity, that have investment in, in terms of technology and all that, actually we are doing more. So whatever it is, uh, there must be a time where there will be turbulence in the operating sector. It is a lot. The turbulence could come from policy, uh, policy change or whatever. Uh, for instance, we they have the deregulation of the foreign exchange market, for instance, with all the implications for, for, for the economy and, of course, specifically for businesses. Um, some of them obviously could be something that you never expected, a sort of a black swan pheno phenomenon. You never expected it. And COVID-19 was one. It just suddenly came and then businesses had to struggle with them. So it too, it can also only take the capacity, the institutional strengths of big businesses to be able to ride the storm in the operating environment. I think what is also important is the whole issue of the concept of what happened in the marketplace. The marketplace is a place for competition. All businesses are in competition for the attention and of course the patronage of, of customers. That is what we call competition. And the institution therefore, businesses that play in that sector uh, will need the right capacity, the right, the right size to be able to effectively compete. In most cases, micro small businesses tend to be crushed. Uh, by the big businesses. So um, getting big and be big, it has a huge competitive advantage. And of course, with the whole issue of institutional efficiency, we do know that big businesses, if properly managed, has a benefit of scale. And that translates to higher profit margin. So for a business, it is about a big and then more resilient, um, more able to actually, you know, uh, uh, compete effectively in the marketplace, and of course, doing so in a very in an efficient manner. Maybe due to the huge investment in technology and human capacity. So let's move to the business owner dimension. I, I want to make this clear. I said you are in charity. If you therefore set up any enterprise. The expectation is a return on your investment and your effort, uh, you know. And, and, and so larger businesses um, ordinarily would translate, I mean, be able to deliver greater value. Uh, for instance, the volume of business uh, will obviously will be higher and all things being equal that could translate to greater, the higher revenue and of course profit. So the, the, the in a big business, if I decide to grow, obviously I will grow because I really want to take a huge uh, value on, on my effort and on my on investment. Um, it is not just about uh, what you receive, probably in terms of dividends, you know, huge dividends from your business. It is not just all about that. It is also about what would that translate to? that can translate to a higher uh, quality of life for you, members of your household, and even others. Um, for instance, you're able to ensure that your children have access to quality education wherever uh, available, anywhere. Of course, able to also have access to quality health uh, care. Uh, there should be some element of some lost jury um, on Saturday specifically, a friend of mine called me um, uh, from Europe and he simply just said that they have himself and the wife have just ended a eight day cruise, ship cruise in the Mediterranean uh, Sea. Uh, and the way he said it, it was like a virus. I, I could know that they enjoyed. But please, that, those are some of the benefits that an entrepreneur after putting all everything into it, especially able to grow up your business big, that obviously will enjoy. 
Uh, it, it, it is for a business owner, is a big business is also bring some sense of fulfillment. You look back that you grew a business from a very small one. And eventually when it talked about the volume it delivers, it talks about the return and talks about the staffing and few number, there's a sense of fulfillment. And there's also the whole element of acknowledgement. Um, you, it is not because you feel well about yourself. It's also about you know, the, the being acknowledged. Uh, on Saturday, the Chartered Institute of Bankers, for instance, um, unknown you know, 20 prominent Nigerians, um, professors, those who are in business, of course, I was one of them. Uh, it was quite interesting seeing people. They, they honor me not because my name is Godwin. I think they honor me because of what LAPO has transformed me. So for a business owner, it's about value. It's about you know, having better quality of life for yourself, members of your household. And of course, the whole sense of fulfillment can actually be very valuable. And of course, the acknowledgement. Now, we go to the dimension of um, job creation. You know, we look at the dimension of, 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 of national development. Um, the first thing is that we do know that one of the biggest contribution of large businesses is the creation of mass job, you know, creating mass job. If you look at some of these big businesses and see what they are, I think two years ago, uh, an agency listed the names, the list of businesses that by the number, rank them by the number of, uh, of employees they have. And you could see that these were big businesses. Of course, the Lapo system was number five. But that's again, it is not only in this case, it's a contribution to human development. Realizing that for every one employee has other people who depends on, on, on him or her. You know? And so it is not just about make a contribution to economic development, but it's also make a contribution to human uh, development. Big businesses obviously make huge contribution to national treasury. Um, we do also know that if you look at the percentage, I think between 32, 33 or more uh, percent when it comes to the inter um, uh, company task, you know, as a percentage of the, uh, the, the, the profit, and so when you therefore have huge businesses, obviously they make so much contribution to national treasury. It is not just about, for me, the company task. It's also about the pay. If you therefore, as a large enterprise, you have large number of uh, employees, you obviously pay huge when you put it together and everybody employee paying pay. Obviously, uh, you are making contribution to the Treasury, uh, both at the national and also at the sub-national, especially the states. So for me, these are some of the you know, broad uh, uh, factor or motivation for one to decide to set up a business. I, don't, I want this, my business to be sustainable. And for this business to be sustainable, there is need to scale up uh, to be able to deal with challenges and more resilience. I, I want to live a better life. So whatever it is today, I want to see if I can create greater value for myself. And of course, I want to make contribution to national uh, development. And now the, the question we, where we are going to get to at this point is to how do we do it? How do we do it? Um, when you ask people to scale up, um, the, the first issue would be, what is the commitment of the owner to scale up? So the first step would be that the business owner must make a very strong commitment, you know, to, to, to scale up um, his business. He must make a very strong commitment. Let me give you a, a story. Uh, this commitment obviously before then comes from the fact that you're dissatisfied with the current state, the current state of your business. Um, I have been managing business for about 10 years. This is where we are. Uh, for whatever reason, of course, there must be reason to explain it away why it, re it remains small. Um, and of course, when, especially when you are in a settle where there is opportunity, 
a huge market opportunity for, for expansion. But the issue of dissatisfaction, I, I, let me put a story here. In 1999, uh, I, I was involved uh, with other persons across the continent to develop microfinance in Africa. And we wanted to set up a network, African network of microfinance. Uh, and we had a meeting in Cape Town, South Africa. After, in the evening, after one of the days, um, we gathered in a restaurant and I sat side by side with a friend of mine, Barry. Barry is from Guinea. And between my poor French and his poorer English, we were able to determine what was the balance sheet size of LAPO. And the instant response from Barry was this, pas beaucoup in French. Uh, en français, okay. In French, pas beaucoup actually means not much. And, and of course, I, I knew myself that put side by side with other institutions across the uh, continent, we're not there, we're not there. And I got dissatisfied and I make a very clear commitment that I want to be bigger. Of course, if, if you take across the continent today, we, as a microfinance yeah, institution or bank, we take number one position. So, but at that point, I wanted to make the, the decision. So what therefore comes across the mind of a business owner, whether it is small, um, you have a pharmacy, for instance, why for instance should it be one unit? Why can't have a network of pharmacy location? If you have a professional office, why should it be one unit? Why not have offices in Abuja, uh, Port Harcourt, and a few other things? If you have a small production, why not you know, expand those production? They must you make that decision must be made. No other person will make that decision except the business owner. And so once that is done, the next step will be that um, you no, step number two will be the need to conduct institutional review of the enterprise. What you want to scale up is not yourself, it's the business you want to scale up. And so there is need to have a diagnostic exercise on the companies and with two major objectives. The first objective is to identify systemic weaknesses that have kept the business small. Um, often we, we think when, when we talk about challenges that we have in our businesses, we tend to always put the mirror of blame to other people. It, it is about the economic situation. It is about uh, whatever factor. And of course, some people will actually blame almost everybody, including the staff. But one person they will not blame is the business owner itself. So, and at the end, the business owner may actually be the whole issue, the issues. The decision is taken, or the decision has taken, the way he runs the business may be responsible. So a very clear diagnostic um, uh, exercise would try to highlight those systemic um, weaknesses. It is not just to highlight them. It must also go the second objective, to identify steps to be taken to bring about institutional growth. That, that is also uh, very important. So I, I would cancel that you don't need to do it yourself. It is. It, it may not be fruitful. Um, when we did our own, we did LAPO only two thousand and two, and we were able to bring um, a, a Washington DC organization called Microridge to come and do that. I, I don't expect that you. I mean, I'm not recommending that you get somebody from outside the country. There are people who can actually do that for you. But what was important was that for one week, Monday to Friday in Benin, they were with us three of them, and they turned the organization upside down. On Friday, they came up with a report, and the leader, Demia, told me, Godwin, um, you lapo his head and shoulder above other NGOs. And I said, Demia, that is not what I want to hear. I want to hear what are the gaps. And of course, he promised that those would come up in the report, and they came up in the report, the gaps that we needed to address if we want to grow. And of course, the, the, the third term, ter, step will be, how do you implement getting those reports? I, I want to say that in most cases, those reports will not make you feel good. Because especially highlighting those areas, uh, often when we run businesses, we think that we are doing it very well. 
until probably a second opinion comes in. And so those things, those reports will throw up a number of institutional issues. Those are the institutional issues that will be thrown up, governance issues. For instance, do you have a board? Um, when I cancel small business, when I talked about board, it's like, what do I need a board for? Of course, um, the LAPO set up the first board 1995 with some women who were borrowers, but a university professor, a professional chartered accountant, a, um, a, a teacher, and a businesswoman who obviously was the chairman of the board. So you, you need to look at that. You can talk, throw up the issue of financial management. We are going to address this when we now talk, talk the, how the steps to be taken. Um, HR, people's management issue, obviously will come up. And of course, risk management. The funny thing about owners of micro small businesses tend to be, when you talk about uh, risk management, it's like you are speaking Greek. It is not new. In 1995, a friend of mine, uh, German, said, Godwin, you people put risk management uh, um, framework in place. I thought he probably was talking of something else. But it is very important if you want to be big and if you are able to, to run a big business. Now, let us take the intervention, governor's intervention. Uh, when it comes to governor's intervention, it's about setting up a board. The first, that the first board is a key organ of governance. And so when you talk about board, what comes to mind, people ask you, is the membership. How many people should be on the board? And my counsel for small businesses should be not more than five. And when you get bigger and more complex, obviously you could need more people. Um, the, the, the other thing is also who should be, what's the quality of these people? The first thing is should be people you know very well. You know where in the context of integrity, the experience and expertise they possess that they will bring into your business uh, to see how they can help you to grow the business. So you need to look at that. Uh, governance is also about the governance processes. You know, I, I do know that people, some people have board, they put the name of people on their board, meetings are never had. Okay, meetings are never had. Uh, and of course, you also look at a small process a regulation, it, it, probably the professional will call it the board charter or manuals. Um, you, you make sure that meetings are held regularly. And of course, the level of discussion. Um, the, the big one is that you submit yourself to the board. This is the one that is quite big. Uh, then you can operationalize this one. Providing all necessary information that's required for the board to make informed and quality decisions provide them. You are not holding anything back. Uh, the, the, the second thing is the implementation of the board, the decision of the board. I think the biggest one that people obviously would push back is that you submit your board yourself together by put, ensuring that the board determines your remuneration. Uh, I, I say this right from the one. I have been on salary when starting the organization and so up to the time I stepped down in 2022, the last review from the board was 2017 of my salary. And when they were going to discuss, they asked me to step out. And of course, the chairman of the remuneration committee uh, talked to me and about it. And, and she was new. And she was like, oh, this is how I'm proud to be a, a board on this organization. You know, we are determining the salary of the MD. This is not just MD, the founder MD, and the other members told him that that has been our practice. Uh, if it is not very, it is not really unusual. The first thing is that it enables you to attain some level of personal financial discipline. That's number one. It, it, it keeps more money in the business to grow. But anyway, if at the end of the year, financial year, you put all your financial together and then you have the net profit, the money still belong to you as a business owner. So why? Of course, you have to provide some incentive for the directors in terms of, you know, small sitting allowance. You know, whenever they meet, you pay them something. If the business, as you desire, it becomes big, then you can begin to pay uh, board fees. As, as well. The, the second one is the financial management. 
um, you need to actually put some basic financial system in place. Do you have basic books of accounts and uh, books of record and accounts, primary books of entries, you know, receipts? Uh, but then you talk about cash book, you know, able to come up with, you know, a, a, a basic financial uh, report uh, system. If, for instance, your wife, your son was doing it, like if doing ar ar arithmetic, like revenue minus expenditure equals surplus, then you need to probably get someone else who can actually do some basic account to have some skills to do that. Um, it, it is important because um, you must be able to have an accounting system that is able to catch up, process, and report all your financial transactions. And coming up with a report that reflects the transaction in the business. Uh, so it, it is important to pay attention uh, to that. Finan you need to come up with a budget. Uh, I asked somebody, do you have a budget? I said, why should I have a budget? We don't have money. I said, no, it is not about whether you have money or not. You need to have a budget. Of course, you need to have an independent uh, review of your accounting, of your reports in the form of having external auditors. In 1992, uh, probably our balance sheet was no more than maybe 10, 10 or 5 million or whatever. And I wanted to have a standard editor. I went to someone, a very prominent uh, chartered accountant in Benin, and I went there. The management, the managing partner was very direct and straight. We do not take any business that is less than 5 million. I mean, 5,000 naira. I, I never had 5,000 naira to pay. But somebody led me to a worry where a standard auditor took two two thousand for us, and that was a blow in engaging our partners, local and international. So there's need. You don't need to engage the top uh, end auditors. Take them. Let's look at your books and provide you with some uh, uh, so, some opinion, as it were. And of course, human resource is also very important. People's management. The thing that micro small businesses tend to disregard is managing the people. Uh, I mean, the people who work for them. Unfortunately, people tend to always tell us that, oh, customers are king and queens, customers are everything. I tell people that if customers are king and queens, the king makers are your, uh, are your employee. And therefore, you must take care of them. You must ensure that the process of recruitment based on merit um, to, to, a large, to a large extent, of course, there's need for you to develop a very clear job description to aid your appra appra appraisal process. If you don't give me what to do, you may not be able to appraise. No matter how rudimentary it is, do it. Do, do it. Training, you know, career path, uh, very early let your staff, even if they are five, let them know that in the next six years, they are three years or whatever, this is where they are like, likely going to be. Uh, promotion, sanction must be very clear and the remuneration be. Now, um, I think time, but let me see. Now, once you've taken care of some of these intervention, governance, financial management, people's management, and, few, and of course, risk management, um, you need to therefore come up with a business plan for growth, usually for five years, okay? And so clear objective, where do I want to be? When we started our scaling up program in 2002, and um, it was very clear that this is where we want to be. So the objectives were very clear. We want to ask, be able to assess funds to grow. Um, we want to be able to create a system that provides us with reports that are reliable, uh, for instance. We want to be able to reach this number of borrowers. We want to establish this number of branches and a few other things. So of course, there will be, why do you want to do it? You need to also identify. If, for instance, I have um, a medical facility, uh, when we'll, it's one branch, I will say, in the next five years, we're going to probably work and do through two or three. You know, how do we go about it? What are the key issues? that we need the strategy to do. Of course, there will be challenges and risk. You need to identify them, especially the risk, and how do you try to mitigate those risks will be there. Um, what is most important is there is need for projections, operational and financial projections, projections of your revenue, 
for the next five years. We clear annual um, uh, milestones. So this is where we want to be in terms of revenue, in terms of expenses, they were, in terms of profitability, this ought to be. You actually also project your, your balance sheets, you know, what you want to be in the next five years. It's, it's very, very important. Um, a business without a plan, it is like a ship on the high sea without a compass. So it, no matter how people will think that is difficult to do, try and get assistance and something to, 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 to come up with a brand. Now, uh, we are com I'm coming to the, uh, gradually to the end. Um, you have done all this, you need capital to grow. I, I'm see, I hear somebody must have been having this in mind, you know, or you have done all that, where do you get the money? Surprisingly, this is the easiest to come by. Uh, again, I surprise people when I say this. Um, what is important is that once you have been able to build institutional strength and that generate report that you have confidence, people will give you money. In, in 2005, after we have completed the implementation of our scaling plan, I was doing a program outside the country, Harvard, two, two weeks. And part from a, a, a founder from the Netherlands uh, wrote to us and said, look, um, when we when they came to Benin for due diligence, they said, okay, we'll give us 300,000 euro. I think euro was not in, in paper then. Uh, but when they got back, they said we can they increase it to 400 euro, thousand euro. But that was not the issue. The issue was that they want to deliver. And I said, no, I'm outside the country. Let me. They said, no, they will send the, uh, the, the agreement. Of course, they sent it to my apartment in, in the US, uh, in, in Harvard, and I signed that. So they were actually willing. It's like begging us to, to take money. So when you have this in place, you have a good business plan in place. The truth is this, those who own the money fund, whether banks, equity, equity, they want to give you money. These guys are in business. They can only make profit if they deliver loan to people. And therefore they want to deliver people, loan to people. But they are only looking institutional vehicle that are resilient, that are strong and big that they can deliver um, a loan to. And of course, what are the sources? Equity participation, people say want to invest in your business. Um, loans, overdraft. Um, of course, many people, especially small businesses, they don't also, uh, probably not aware of what leasing could do. You know, leasing, instead of buying equipment, you lease them. The good thing is about it, if you have an asset, the asset is not about your own needs, it's by the use of it. You don't necessarily to own all the asset. What is important is the use of it. It's not necessarily because you own it. So, of course, trade credit is also an avail a valuable thing. Of course, um, what do funders will look at? When we talk about people who have provided us so much money, I have seen 2012, $5 million. Uh, later, they made it out of $20 million. Um, other people, they, they do that. What they really look, African Development Bank, I think $12 million. So what they really look at are very clear. They look at the governors. Who are the people in charge of setting agenda for this institution? Who provide strategic leadership for this institution? Who provide oversight in, on this institution? And of course, who in their own action and decision, who protect the asset of that, of that business? That's the way of God, the quality of the governor. They look at your ministry. Uh, of meeting and then of course they will look at the management who are those people managing this place and they look at the operation that's where the money will go in anyway in the first place and of course they go to the derive you no know, the derive something is the performance it's after you have the right management you have the board you have operation then you have the performance what is your profitability once these are right to give you money um in, in i think in 2010 or level, level, precisely. The IFC carried, came for due diligence on LAPO. We're already in our office Lagos here. And they made sure that almost seven of them, you know, from their head office, from South Africa office, from uh, of, uh, Asia, one person, one from Latin America. Why they were doing this is this. Why IFC has given loan to microfinance in Nigeria who are owned by international. This is the first time they were giving a loan to a microfinance bank set up by an African in on, on the soil of Africa. So 
um, there was a lot of apprehension. But after one week of due diligence, Monday, uh, the guy who led the team said, Godwin, it is not about whether we give LAPO money or not. It's about the terms, how much, and what will be the interest rate. So the institutional strength determines is some of these things. Of course, who, what the obstacles? I actually want to say obstacle one, one obstacle. And the main obstacle to the process of scaling up, even to begin or to successfully implement it, is the business owner. That's it, is the, the other person. And because I led this organization and I make it very clear that I have made it a commitment, I was able to push through. Uh, the first thing people are going to think when you talked about them, so no, it's not possible. Uh, you know, Lapo, you are big. And I can also point to the fact that I, I, I started with three women and I was running Lapo from my city room. So, and then, so what, what could be smaller than that? You know, and so the, somebody may be thinking that this guy is just speaking grammar. It is not possible. I can tell you it is possible. And we have done it. So, of course, people will fear that we will lose control when the business becomes big. Yes, true. Your, your dominance of the business will, 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 will be uh, put down, but you do not lose control. Um, you, you, you actually get more in terms of returns on your efforts than when you continue to remain uh, small. And of course, um, someone will say, oh, what the process I have identified tend to require capacity to do. Of course, yes. Uh, not only capacity, it will give you some stress. Let me, let me warn you. But you can get assistance. We got assistance to do it. You know, people to come, you know. Some come in, let's look at this issue and, and, and work it out. So you, you, the point I'm making here is that the only person that will start the process of scaling up your business is possibly you, the business owner. And so by way of concluding remarks, um, the, 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 the truth is that many people admire large businesses. You know, oh, this is a dangote, they are, they are, they are big. big. I, I'm not saying that you instantly become dangote. Actually, dangote became what it is for almost 40 years or more. So you could actually begin to scale up your business. Uh, of course, uh, the benefits are there. I have talked about benefits that accrue to you as a business owner. The, the, the benefit to the business that becomes sustainable. We've been around for more than 30 years. And so it could be more. So you need to be strength. You need um, size, you know, to be able to uh, dominate and create more value for you and for the national economy. Of course, the business, scaling up business does not come about by accident. You, you cannot say, let me just do it. No, it, it, it's not about wish, may wish but it must be by deliberate action, like some of the things I've identified. Of course, business owner is central to the success of the skill. It's just a bad, I, try, I want to repeat this and repeat it because of the importance of it, that the business owner is, could be a prime mover. And of course, it could also be a very, very formidable obstacle to success in scaling up your business. And therefore, I want to thank you for your attention. Wow. Thank you so much, sir. You ended the session right on time. Actually, we, we have more time for you if you would still like to say a few things. Let's take questions. Yes, let's take questions. You want me to say a few things? Yes, if, if, if you want to. I mean, okay, I, I, I think... think very, um, very, yeah, it, it may be what I may say here uh, will be things that probably will give uh, credibility to what I'm saying. The, the, the whole thing is about people may be a bit skeptical that is it, this thing is possible. Um, when I took that decision to give 100 naira each to three women, uh, Felicia Moye was a, a, a wife of a very old member of my church. Uh, uh, Monica Gubike was the. Uh, are you still hearing me? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Well, Monica Gubike was a wife of a driver, and the other small girl, um, 
will be a gile wonko. Give them 100 naira, they use it to buy cassava in Oguashuku. And are for market, if you are from that area, Oguashuku markets are for. They buy, and in the evening, I go about to collect 100, 110 naira uh, each. And eventually, uh, we, we grow. I, I was still doing it as a, a, a voluntary organization. But by 1992, I resigned uh, to do it on the floor. And I was doing it at home in my city room. Uh, Marco was very apprehensive. Why are you resigned from a government? I was already a senior officer, a special cadre in the Bender State Ministry of uh, uh, Bender State Government. And so why should you do that? And again, I was I did it from my home again full time for one year, and that uh, in 1992 that was quite unusual. That the concept of working is leaving home, so I was doing that. But what matter is this? I was doing it small. It was small, you know, and all that, until I had that paboku uh, from from my friend Barry, and and I said, look, I want to uh, be, be big. And so let's see how what we have be big immediately uh, after we scale up. We have funding. You know, uh, the first came from um, Novi, uh, Netherlands. Um, one guy came visiting from uh, Belgium. He just went within looking at a record, he said he approved $1 million, Dutch Mark $1 million. And it just uh, starts to grow, starts to grow because we have a business plan. But where are we today? You know, a small thing that started with three customers. Where are we today? We serve millions. Uh, Lapo probably is the only microfinance bank that has operation in 34 states. If you add the Abuja to it, I don't want to say an Abuja, if you add Abuja to it, <laughs> for obvious reasons. So, and that is that is it, millions of people. We have, Lapo has a, one of the best microfinance companies in Sierra Leone. Um, not only that, because the conceptual, the way I conceptualized LAPO was actually to do three things, provide money for people, health, and the social empowerment. And so for economic empowerment, we set up, the, we have the biggest micro leasing company in this country. In fact, the managing director of that uh, micro leasing company is the chairman of Nigeria Equipment Leasing Association of Nigeria. And, and, and then we have the first micro insurance, uh, licensed micro insurance company in, in this country. And of course, we, we, we have a, 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 a Molotechnic, which used to be our training unit that offer OND, HN, OND in microfinance and other, other uh, courses. Of course, because of the head part of it, we have, the, I think, probably the most resource medical facility in. I would say South South in Benin City is called Benin Medical Care, not Benin Medical Center. MRI, whatever city scan and whatever is that. So we have grown. And then when you not talk about volume, we are volume billions. And when you not talk about staff, the staff strength as at two, year, two months ago is 10,320 excluding the drivers and the cleaners. So if it could be possible to take from two, 20, two, two clients, one staff will go, will go as I was working with me to where we are today. I, I think it's clearly possible. What is required is the commitment. Uh, what is required is a firm decision. Uh, what is required is to take those decisions. So I think for me, um, uh, it, it is possible and I have, assisted people to do it. I know one of the microfinance uh, NGO is doing well because we assisted them to do it. So it is possible to take whatever your business uh, to a higher level. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's a great privilege to have uh, Dr. Godwin Iyigyam Muso. Uh, he's the founder of LAPO Microfinance. Uh, as a member of the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship International. And we are really honored. We consider it a great privilege to have you with us tonight, sir. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank now, you, before, thank, you, thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. You're welcome, sir. Uh, yeah. But before we 
hand over the meeting to our guest speaker tonight. Uh, it, it's important to introduce him properly uh, because uh, I know what it will cost us on a good day to get him into a meeting um, with his level of experience. Uh, so uh, please permit me to introduce him very quickly. Uh, Dr. Godwin Eigiamuso is an accomplished entrepreneur who has applied the concept of social enterprise to successfully build a number of enterprises which address the needs of persons and businesses at the bottom end of the society. He has grown LAPO, uh, which we know as LAPO Microfinance Bank today, a human development enterprise he founded over 30 years ago into a vibrant conglomerate with interest in microfinance, technology, insurance, leasing, healthcare, and education in Nigeria and beyond with over 10,000 full-time staff. So essentially, he built this business bottom up from the first staff to over 10,000 people. In 2019, he established the Benin Medical Care, a medical facility with state-of-the-art diagnostic and medical equipment. He is the chairman, Goxi Micro Insurance Limited, the first licensed micro insurance company in Nigeria. Dr. Eigiamuso earned a PhD in policy and development studies. He has been honored with several awards, which include Honorary Doctor of Science, DSC, by the University of Benin, for his outstanding contributions to human development in the year 2016, uh, Nigeria's Model Entrepreneur Award of the Faith Foundation in 2008, the Lagos Business School's Distinguished Alumni Award in 2014. And there are also many other awards that I saw online which um, are not on this profile uh, because, I mean, it wasn't listed there, but is a globally recognized expert in microfinance and locally um, across the world is recognized as one of the leading voices. He's a live member of the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship International. So we're privileged tonight to welcome Dr. Heigiamuso as he takes the microphone to talk to us about how to scale our businesses. 